Episode number 159 There were to be no ceremonious performances, everything was to be as natural and home-like as possible, so when Aunt March arrived, she was scandalized to see the bride come running to welcome and lead her in, to find the bridegroom fastening up a garland that had fallen down, and to catch a glimpse of the paternal minister marching upstairs with a grave countenance and a wine bottle under each arm. Upon my word, here's a state of things, cried the old lady, taking the seat of honor prepared for her, and settling the folds of her lavender moire with a great rustle. You oughtn't to be seen till the last minute, child. I'm not a show, Andy, and no one is coming to stare at me, to criticize my dress, or count the cost of my luncheon. I'm too happy to care what anyone says, or thinks, and I'm going to have my little wedding just as I like it. John, dear, here's your hammer. And away went Meg to help that man in his highly improper employment. Mr. Burke didn't even say thank you. But as he stooped for the unromantic too, he kissed his little bride behind the folding door with a look that made Aunt Marge whisk out her pocket handkerchief with a sudden blue in her sharp old eyes. A crash, a cry, and a laugh from Laurie. Accompanied by the indecorous exclamation, Jupiter Ammon. Joe's upset the cake again. Caused a momentary flurry, which was hardly over when a flock of cousins arrived, and the party came in, as Beth used to say when a child. Don't let that young giant come near me, he worries me worse than mosquitoes, whispered the old lady to Amy, as the rooms filled, and Lori's black head towered above the rest. He has promised to be very good today, and he can be perfectly elegant if he likes, returned Amy, and gliding away to warn Hercules to beware of the dragon, which warning caused him to haunt the old lady with a devotion that nearly distracted her. There was no bridal procession, but a sudden silence fell upon the room as Mr. March and the young couple took their places under the green arch. Mother and sisters gathered close, as if loath to give Meg up. The fatherly voice broke more than once, which only seemed to make the service more beautiful and solemn. The bridegroom's hand trembled visibly, and no one heard his replies. But Meg looked straight up in her husband's eyes, and said, I will. With such tender trust in her own face and voice that her mother's heart rejoiced, and Aunt March sniffed audibly. Jo did not cry, though she was very near it once and was only saved from a demonstration by the consciousness that Lori was staring fixedly at her, with a comical mixture of merriment and emotion in his wicked black eyes. Beth kept her face hidden on her mother's shoulder, but Amy stood like a graceful statue, with a most becoming ray of sunshine touching her white forehead and the flower in her hair. It wasn't at all the thing, I'm afraid, but the minute she was fairly married, Meg cried, the first kiss for Marmy. And turning, gave it with her heart on her lips. During the next fifteen minutes she looked more like a rose than ever, for everyone availed themselves of their privileges to the fullest extent, from Mr. Lawrence to old Hannah, who, adorned with a headdress fearfully and wonderfully made, fell upon her in the hall, crying with a sob and a chuckle. Bless you, dearie, a hundred times. The cake ain't her tonight, and everything looks lovely.